Good morning, Grace Commons. Thank you to Pat Holmberg, our very own Pat Holmberg, for that beautiful Debussy piece. Friends, let me invite you on into the sanctuary. We're gonna get started like we always do by standing and singing praise to God as we gather and worship this morning. Yeah, stand on up. I'm gonna read some scripture for us as we are called to worship today. We're gonna hear from Anthony about being set apart and consecrated as the people of God. And so let me read you this passage that many of you have no doubt memorized. From Colossians 3, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let's sing and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning.
you lead us today in what you have for us and what your spirit says and does in our hearts? That's what we want. Amen. Friends, let's continue singing. Lois. Okay, you can all be seated. Well, welcome. Good morning. My name is Kelsey Walega. I have the privilege of serving here as one of the co-directors of Young Adult Ministry, and we're so glad to be worshiping with you in person and also online. And this last week, Camp Timberline's Out of Bounds Day Camp was here hosting camp for kids, which was a lot of fun. So there were screams and squeals of delight throughout the church all week. And beyond kids got to uh, play sports, dance, be crazy, and beyond that, they also got to hear about and experience the love of Jesus. And it was a bit of a blast from the past for me, because many of you might know I used to be a counselor at Camp Timberline, and then later a director at Camp Timberline. One of my campers, who I had when she was 13, is now the director of Out of Bounds Day Camp. So I feel old. But it was a reminder of how these weeks that kids get to experience Jesus in this way at camp can have far-reaching effects for the rest of their lives, which was a really great reminder. And I don't know how else to transition to this next thing. So the other thing that has far-reaching effects, books. Books have far-reaching effects. There's a used book giveaway today in the atrium of books that have been donated and also duplicates from our library. So check that out after service today. And then next week after service, we will be celebrating Emily Kreider and her family as she leaves ministry here at the church. I can think of no better way to celebrate the children's pastor than ice cream at 1030 in the morning. So next week, be sure to tell Emily and her family how grateful you are for her and for her ministry here at Grace Commons. And then later that day, we'll be at Faith Day at the Colorado Rockies. So if you're interested in joining us there, 
you can find out more information in the bulletin or online to get your tickets. And then last thing, we are celebrating communion today. So if you are worshiping with us at home, you can go ahead and get your communion elements ready. And before we take our offering this morning, we have a bit of family news. Shirley Keller passed away earlier this week. Crazily enough, she passed away on her 97th birthday. Uh, But even with a long and good life lived, be sure to keep um, her family, Andy, Jody, the rest of the Keller family in your prayers. The memorial service is still pending. And if this is your first time visiting with us this morning, please do not feel the need to give, but you can fill out a connect card at the bottom of your bulletin and then put that in the offering plate so that we can get to know you better. And for those of you who would like to give, there are envelopes in the back of your pews or boxes in the back, and you can always give online. And this month, uh, while the choir is taking a bit of a break, we will be hearing from different musicians while we take the offering. And this morning, we get to hear from our very own Pat Holmberg. seated and it is time for our little ones to make their way up for their time up front here so if you are elementary age and you want to make your way up here we got a table here so be careful of it but you can just sit on the pews sit on the carpet just come make yourself at home
Come on up. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? I have a very important question. Who has ever been on a hike before? Raise your hand if you've ever been on a hike. Okay, most of you. What is your favorite part of a hike? The bears? <laughs> wow. I need to hike with you. That sounds exciting. The bears, yeah. When you get to the top. Woo, that can be breathtaking, right? To see something beautiful. What else? Lucy, you have a favorite part of a hike? You like all of it? What else? Anybody ever take, like, eat a good snack on a hike? Did your mom or dad bring you a good snack? What's a good snack to eat on a hike? Chocolate bars. Chocolate bars and bears. Sounds fun. All right, Lydia, what do you like to eat on a hike? Candy. Oh, yeah. My, my wife brings like little gummies, and they are ju they'll just get you through that next little stretch of the hike if you eat a gummy. Anybody else have a favorite part of a hike? Favorite snack? Well, everybody stand up. We're actually going to take a hike right now. Everybody stand up. We're gonna get in a line. I like how Leah and Molly are holding hands. They look like good friends. So why don't everybody get behind Leah and Molly in a single file line? Just kinda everybody line up back here. Here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna hold hands too, that's great. We're gonna march around the table, uh, let's see, seven times, okay? So every time you go by, I want you guys to touch that little golden tassel and just move around this table, ready? Molly, you lead them, okay? They're following you guys. Ready, go. Touch it, and then just come around the table. Now come this way, Molly. Come around the table this way. Everybody walk this way. Let's hike around the table. Touch the little golden tassel on the table. Keep going, Molly. How many times is that? There's two congregation count when Molly touches it. Okay, here we go. Molly's about halfway through. Another lap here. All right. How many times is this gonna be? That's three. Keep going, keep going. I know it sounds silly, but we're gonna get all the way to seven. Molly's making another turn here. All right, this is four. All right, keep going. I like how we're holding hands. We got a little assembly line. All right, Molly, we got another turn here. How many is this, guys? Five, two more, here we go. Keep going. Keep going. Here comes Molly. This would be number Six. nice. Nice. Keep going, Molly. Everybody touch it. Uh oh. We got a speed bump. All right. Here we go. Molly's taking her last turn. Here it comes, number. Six. Okay, everybody keep going until you touch it. Yeah. Keep going. Everybody's got to touch it. Everybody's got to touch it. Come on, Graham. You're the caboose. Get there, buddy. And once you're done, Molly, you can just go ahead and sit back down. Graham's the caboose. All right, now everybody sit down. Once Graham, Graham, touch the little tassel. You're the last one. All right, now everybody can have a seat again. So I want to tell you a really quick funny story, and then I'll tell you why we did that. So one time I went on a hike in Tennessee. It was a beautiful place, lots of mountains. And my son, Hudson, he's 10 years old now, but he was like six at the time. And we were gonna go on a hike at a national park, and the sign said, you really should be careful when you take this hike. There might be, what? Bears. There might be bears. It felt like we were at like where Yogi Bear lives. It didn't feel very dangerous, like lots of families. And so Hudson said, Dad, we should not take this hike. The sign says there might be bears. And we said, Hudson, it'll be okay. There are not gonna be bears, we'll be fine. Um, but Hudson read the sign and Hudson took the sign serious, but we just told Hudson, we think this will be okay. So we went on our hike, we ate our chocolates, we ate our gummies, and then I saw a little rustling in a bush right off the trail. And I thought it was a human being that might have, you know, saw, you know, something to go check out. But sure enough, what do you think it was? It was a bear, a big mama bear. And guess what, we were like, from here to the door, out to the sanctuary, which you guys are gonna leave here in a moment. And, and then guess what? The mama bear was over here, 
and all her babies were in the water over here. And we were about to be right between mama bear and her baby bears, which would not have been good. But we had said a prayer before the hike that God would keep us safe, and he did. So we went back to our cars. And what do you think Hudson said the whole time? <laughs> Dad, read the sign. I told you, nobody listens to me. You just read the sign. You'll know that the bears might come out on the trail. But uh, today, all your parents are going to hear a story about a man named Joshua. And Joshua and all the people of God walked around a city called Jericho. How many times do you think? Seven times, right? It was God's specific instructions to them to be careful to do things his way. And when they did things specifically and carefully his way, good things happened. God presented them to the city. So here's what I want uh, the, the city to them because it was his present to them. Now listen, here's what I want to say to you. Hudson taught our family a lesson right there. It's really important to pay attention to the signs. It's really important for you to read what God says in the Bible and listen to all of it and listen for his careful instructions. Like that day, that I don't think that people, it wouldn't have gone well at Jericho if they had marched six times or five times. God said it has to be seven times. And when they got around the lap that seventh time, God did a miracle. So let's be little ones that trust in God's word and do everything that it says. We're going to say a little blessing over you now. So congregation, let's read these words. Stretch out your hands over these little ones. And let's say these words together. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he smile each time he looks at you. May the Lord help you in everything you do. Amen. All right, you guys can make your way out. Thank you for coming to hang out with me this morning. Bears, chocolates and gummies. All right, would you, in honor of God's word, stand with me? We're going to say these words together. I'm so glad that we're going to say the words from Joshua 1.8. This is the book we're going to look at today. Let's say these words as a reminder if you're visiting today. We do this every week right before we open up God's word to be reminded of what it says about itself. So what I was just sharing with the little ones about being careful to listen to everything God said, this is where that mentality comes from. Let's say these words together. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Amen. You can be seated. Well, I have a question for you. When you get to heaven, I, I just think about all the wonderful meals that are going to take place in heaven. When you get to heaven and you're eating one of those five-star meals that Jesus and his hospitality team prepares, and you find yourself sitting next to a guy named Joshua, do you want to say to Joshua, I always meant to read your book. Um, I meant to get around to it. I know it was somewhere in the Bible, but yeah, tell me what you wrote. Uh, lest you find yourself in that scenario in heaven, we're going to look at what Joshua wrote tonight. But uh, I will tell you right up front, I'm covering too much ground today. We're going through a, a, a book called the Jesus Storybook Bible, which just kind of makes it clear that all these Old Testament stories whisper the name Jesus. And so I'm covering an entire book of the Bible today. I'm going to do it as briefly as I can. But I really want to encourage you, read Joshua 1 through chapter 8. I timed myself. It takes about 15 minutes. It's really not a long read. But if you really want to get... Uh, more of the background of the things I'm trying to explain, just read it this week, Joshua 1 through 8. The reality is that story of Jericho, the people of God marching seven times around the city, it really doesn't make sense if you miss the chapters that come before it. So I'm going to try to give you enough context where you understand this powerful book in the Bible, because I don't want you to get to heaven and go, Joshua, man, I heard you wrote, wrote something, right? So um, this guy, Joshua, who is he? Uh, when I was thinking about uh, how to explain my uh, understanding of Joshua. He is a military guy. And this guy, we obviously know, was a, a man of the military. Um, I'm going to grab my phone here because I put some notes in this morning. So that's General Patton. My dad liked this quote a lot. I'm a soldier. I fight where I'm told to fight, and wherever I fight, I always win. 
So uh, he was obviously a very successful military general in, in, in some ways. Did you know he was also, how many of you have been watching the Olympics? Olympic athlete. He was in the, he was a, in the pentathlon um, event, freestyle swimming, fencing, uh, equestrian, show jumping, pistol shooting, cross country running. So this was a very interesting guy. Uh, not surprisingly, went to Virginia Military Institute. Um, one of the things that's fascinating about General Patton, um, he once saved five kids from drowning. I thought that was a pretty cool story. Kind of wired in him even before he was in the military to kind of be a sacrificial guy. His grandfather was the mayor of LA. His other grandfather fought in the Civil War. So it was just kind of in him, public service. Um, really, you know, when you read out, you know, his most famous maybe military conquest was, you know, the Battle of the Bulls. But after that, World War II, um, he led his army into Germany where they advanced with great speed in this article that I was reading and they captured 80,000 square miles of territory. So all this to say, if you're gonna understand Joshua, his assignment from God was to advance and conquer territory. So you might think of Joshua, you do have to think of him a little bit like you would think of a military figure. He is the guy that takes the baton of leadership from Moses, I'm gonna show you that here in just a moment. Um, but you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then you have the book of Joshua. So it is your sixth book of the Bible. All those first five books, they get you from Adam and Eve, you know, into Noah, into Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Israel come, and then you get to Moses, and they get carried away into slavery. Moses leads them through the Red Sea, but now we're at the starting line of this land that God promised to give, and Moses dies, and God selects his leader, to take possession of the land that he said I've always promised to give you. So Joshua is the guy that assumes that mantle of leadership and it is gonna require some military conquest. Uh, but as you just saw demonstrated by the little ones, God was leading all of it and it was always his way of doing things that needed to be done. Now if I, you know, General Patton was great, um, but you know, that, that pride, that I can do it, that wherever I fight, I always win. Joshua really wasn't that way. Joshua would have said, and this is no disrespect for Gen to General Patton, I've got a lot of respect for him, but I am gonna differentiate Joshua from General Patton. He would have never said, wherever I fight, I always win. He would have said, wherever God fights, we always win. It's his stuff, I'm just following his lead. I'm not fighting, in fact, we, did, we rarely did any fighting. It was always God, and that's part of why he is this really special figure. He always followed God's way of doing things. Now that's the mouse of Narnia named Reepicheep. Raise your hand if you know who Reepicheep is. That would be Joshua to me. Uh, Reepicheep is loyal to Aslan. He will fight you for the name of Aslan. And he will draw his sword. He's little, but he had the heart of a champion. And when, when, when things often don't go well in Narnia, this is C.S. Lewis fictional series, kid series where animals talk, and this is maybe Aslan's most loyal servant. He's not big, but he's mighty and he is loyal. And my favorite moment for Reepicheep is the voyage of the Dawn Treader. All the kids are trying to get to Aslan's land. Aslan is the lion of God. He's the emperor, the son of the emperor over the sea and the kids and the, and the animals are trying to get to his land, but it's gonna mean crossing an impossible body of water and it gets hard and everybody takes a vote and Reepicheep gets outvoted and they notice Reepicheep. I mean, they all say, we gotta quit. The waters are too rough, it's too choppy, the wind, we're gonna die out here, let's go home. And they notice Reepicheep cutting the lifeboat rope. And they say, Reep, we gotta go home. It's too rough, we can't. He goes, then go, but I'm not going. Because I said when I started that I was going to Aslan's land and I meant it. And if the ship turns around and quits, then I'm still going. I'll go in the lifeboat. And when the lifeboat breaks apart because of the weather, then I'll swim. And when I swim, I'll get tired and eventually I'll just be able to doggy paddle. And eventually after I doggy paddle and my little mice feet can't paddle anymore, then I'll drown. And when I drown, then I'll die. But when I die, I will die with my nose pointed at Aslan's land. For he's my Lord and he's my King. Now Joshua was a spy and he got outvoted. In his 40s, he was 43 years old, historians tell us, when Moses sent a delegation of 12 spies to the land that God had promised 
And only two guys, Caleb and Joshua, came back and said, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. They had read these you know, verses, this mentality was in them, and they said, look, I know it looks bad, but we can do it. Why? Because God's with us. Two guys, 10 to two. He was the reap a cheap like spy that brought back a report that said, I know that these guys are bigger, faster, and stronger than us, but I also know there's a God in Israel who just led us out of the Red Sea, and if he promised us to give us this land, we can take it. But the people trembled at the report of the other 10. So now, at the beginning of this book, here's his quote in Numbers, the, in, in the first five books here of your Bible, don't be afraid of the people. This is Joshua's quote. We will devour them. Why? Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. That sounds like reap chief. Aslan's in the camp. What are you scared of? We can take him. But he got overruled. And so he and Caleb, they're still alive. Now, fast forward, he served in Israel's ancient CIA when he was 43, that spy operation. By the time he takes the mantle of leadership, he's 83. So for those of you who think there's no life after retirement, Joshua's life really didn't begin until he was in his 80s. And this is frequently the story of the Bible. Never, until you get to heaven, your life isn't over. There's always something you can do for God. He gets tapped on the shoulder at 83 years old to be God's military general. So there's your first five book of the Bibles. Now we're in uh, Joshua. Here's the last chapter of Numbers before we get to Joshua. Take the son of Nun, Joshua. Don't miss the underlined phrase. A man in whom is the Spirit. That's a reference to the Holy Spirit. Here's his qualification. The Holy Spirit. Lay your hand on it. This is God talking. Make him stand before Eleazar the priest and all the congregation. Commission him in their sight. Now, I don't even want to put this president's picture up because I don't want you to get lost in if he's a Republican or a Democrat. That's not the point. I don't push politics on you. But I, I am fascinated by all the presidents and their pedigree and their qualification. This particular president, he will remain nameless. That's a pretty good resume. Ivy League grad, director of the CIA, served in the military in a significant war, eventually was vice president, then president. Those are credentials. Look, all that just to make this simple point. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, his aide, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you, all these people, cross over the land. I'm about to give them to the Israelites. Actually, before I get there, let me just go back. What is his qualification? This is the point I was trying to make here. The Holy Spirit is his credential. That's it. What does he have? Not an Ivy League degree. Not director of CIA, even though he was a spy. No. Joshua, he's my guy. Why? The Holy Spirit's in him. He'll do what I say. He'll follow me. Because I'm in him, and he's in me. So that's your guy. And Moses passes away. This is who gets chosen. God's hand-picked succession. So Moses dies. Now God says, get ready to cross the Jordan into the land that I'm going to give you. Now listen to this. I'm going to give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your turf, your territory will extend from this desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. This is God saying the territory is large. Now, Joshua was a great leader, yielded to God, full of the Holy Spirit. But do you know how much they eventually will take? 10%. God had a big plan for them, a big set of land. But eventually, when they start intermarrying with other tribes and they just kind of get content, they just stop the conquest. Now, 10% was still a lot. And that's what people argue about still to this day, that land in Israel. So Joshua is the book of the first time that God made good on his promise to give that land to the Jews. And so Joshua is the appointed leader to start taking that territory. He says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. And this is just a wonderful promise for any leader. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. So this is where he's different than General Patton. Our general was confident in his own ability to lead. Joshua stood on one thing, that promise right there. If God's with me, who can be against me? I'm going to stand behind him and just do what he says. And when he did that, good things happened. So I just had this question in my heart all week. As a pastor, you as a Christian, there's just nothing more important than God being with you. Don't lean on your degrees. Don't lean on your intellect. Don't lean on your financial wizardry and your ability to read market trends or whatever it is that you might place confidence in. God being with you. 
That's all you need in your marriage, in your motherhood, in your fatherhood, at work. Just ask him to be with you. Secret of Joshua's success right there. I will be with you. So that's a, a great thing that we can pray. Uh, some of you may recognize that almanac from a very famous movie called Back to the Future 2. Marty McFly, one of the mistakes that Doc Brown would tell him, you should not have smuggled that sports almanac back in time because you could bet on every game when you're in the future and you come back with all the sports resort, results from the last you know, 30 years and make yourself a very rich man. It gets in the wrong person's hands. You know how the story goes. And, but that to just be an illustration of what we read every week. I have you read this because having a Bible in your hand, according to Joshua, is like having a guarantee, a guarantee of success, an open Bible, a man or a woman in their living room with coffee and an open Bible, the guarantee of success, the guarantee right there. I didn't write it. Be careful to do everything written in it. Why? Because you'll be prosperous and successful. Maybe not in all the ways that you're thinking right now of prosper and success, but I'm going to lead you through this conquest and you're going to win if you do everything I say. So Christians need to remember that, an open Bible, the battle cry of the Reformation and Martin Luther, solo scriptura, only scripture. Doesn't matter what a human says, matters what God says. This is his book. That's part of why Joshua was so successful, huge part because he just had this mentality that he passed on to us. Now that is a guy that I really, really love. Raise your hand if you recognize that guy. You need to know who he is, only a few of you. That's Gary Haugen. He started a ministry called International Justice Mission. Doesn't he look like Clark Kent, you think? <laughs> he, has a, he has a cape that he puts on that nobody sees, like Superman. He started a ministry after working for the United States Justice Department when he saw a gross injustice in the world. Played football at Harvard, doesn't look like it, wears his flat top, makes himself out to be some ordinary guy. But when I met him, I said, you're not ordinary. You're a superhero. What moved his heart was this horrible, horrendous injustice, sex trafficking, that little girls would be taken against their will into the most horrible thing, maybe in the history of the world. So Gary said, something's got to be done. I got a law degree. I'm going to go battle to get these girls home with not guns, not, you know, kind of a, a violent way, but with my degrees and with all that I can do, rallying all of America's support, we're gonna go into these countries, take these girls into safe houses, give them their lives back, give them jobs, give them, you know, hope and a future. It's impossible to really talk about the story of Joshua without talking about a woman named Rahab. We don't know her story but we know God rescued a prostitute from the city of Jericho. She lived embedded in the wall of Jericho. Who knows what her story is? Maybe she got put into that line of work against her will. Maybe she didn't know what to do, but we see something in the heart of God that he would say, that's my daughter, I'm taking her back. She's coming with me. And what ends up happening is before they take Jericho, Joshua will send spies, because he worked in the CIA, remember? So he believed in kind of the spy mission. The two guys go into the city and they only meet Rahab and Rahab is kind to them and she hides them when the military of Jericho finds out these spies are there. They're like, I think they went to Rahab's house and Rahab lies on behalf of these two spies, hides them in a roof and says, all I'm asking for in return is I wanna go with you because I think your God is God. I wanna go. And they said, deal, you can come with us, guess what? In the family tree of Jesus, at Christmas time every year, whose name do we read? Rahab's. Rahab was her name. She will get grafted into the very family tree of the Son of God himself because he is so willing to associate with sinful people. And he will rescue even the most far gone person, like Gary Haugen. He will rescue anybody in a lifestyle that they don't want to be in and bring them into his own. So that is a huge part of the story of Joshua is the rescue of a Gentile woman, meaning not a Jewish woman, and bringing her and her whole family, all her people, out of this destruction of the city into the family of God himself. So this is what she does. She sent those spies away, and they departed, and this was the deal. We'll know which house is yours when we see a little scarlet 
rope, which foreshadowed the Passover. When God had destroyed the Egyptians, when there was blood on the doorpost, God said, you don't have anything to worry about. I will spare you and I will rescue you. And so that was the deal. Put a blood-stained scarlet. It wasn't literally blood-stained, but the color of God's salvation plan. Put it in your, out your window and we'll know that everybody in that room is coming with us. Huge part of the story of Jericho and Rahab was her name. So Joshua tells the people, I love this part, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do amazing things about you. I know I needed to hear this this week, that word consecrate. Joshua walks through the camp like General Patton, and he says, God has told me what he's going to do. Consecrate yourself. Consecrate yourself. No drinking tonight. Clean up your language, whatever that meant. Consecrate yourself. God's going to do something tomorrow that's wonderful. So sit up straight. Get your affairs in order. Be careful everything you're doing tonight. Because tomorrow we're going to see God himself do something wonderful. God was going to elevate Joshua by leading them through the Jordan River just like he had the Red Sea. So that was, that's what this reference in Joshua 3 to is. We're going to see another miracle. We're going through the Jordan River, so set yourself apart. I know I needed to hear that. I've been a uh, privilege. I get to coach football at Fairview High School. No offense to Boulder High people or whatever high school you represent. I love them all. I know kids that go to all the schools now, but this one has my heart because my son is a member of this program. They had to do 100 push-ups and sit-ups, 14 80-yard sprints in under 12 seconds, three 300-yard sprints in 60 seconds each. They had to prepare all summer to do this. That's what consecrated means. Set yourself apart to do something with your whole being to show devotion. So we know that in sports, we often see this. I was thinking about this guy this week, Terrell Owens. I'll never forget when he rode the plane home from a Dallas Cowboy game. They just brought out a bunch of Domino's pizza to feed the players. He said, I'm not eating that. My body's consecrated. I only put good fuel in it. I'm not putting pizza in it. So we know that athletes know what it means to be consecrated. He doesn't know I'm going to do this, but I'm going to embarrass one of my favorite guys in the room right now, my guy Ryan Rutherford right here. He blessed me. He plays for Fairview. On the last night of the camp, Coach Mack, who's a believer, has this open mic night. And he lets the players say whatever it is they want to say about the team and their devotion to it. And he says, in your headspace, how do you get through tough times? So during a break, I came up to Ryan and some of his buddies, and I said, y'all ready to give your speech? And Ryan said, yeah, Coach, I'm ready. I'm going to talk about Jesus in Philippians 4.13. I'm going to Christ in front of my peers, in front of 80 other football players. There were only three that did something like that, and all three of them have connections to our church. I was so proud of him. He cares about football. I was thinking about how a Fairview wins a state title this year, how it'll be forgotten in a million years, but not what Ryan did. See, the Bible says Jesus doesn't forget that stuff. When you declare his name, he says, you call me out in front of your peers, I'm calling you out in front of all the angels. Consecrate yourself before the Lord. Sports are great, but being consecrated for Jesus, being set apart, being unashamed of his name, all those things kind of implied in Joshua's text there, set yourself apart for the Lord is going to do wonderful things. So when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifts up his eyes, and this is such a wonderful part of the story. And behold, a man was standing before him. I think this is in Joshua 5, with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And the individual said, No. Wrong question. Are you for us or against us? Now remember, this is Repachit. He draws a sword. This is Joshua. He doesn't know who this guy is. And he said, no, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. And now I have come. This is right before the battle of Jericho. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped him and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And he replied, take off your shoes for the place where you're standing is holy. Why did he do that? Because Moses had the same encounter. Who is this guy? Jesus. 
Now, he didn't know his name was Jesus. Here's the irony of the story. You know what Joshua's name is? Jesus. When you say Joshua in Hebrew, you say Yeshua. When you say Jesus in Hebrew, you say Yeshua. So this is Jesus, meet Jesus. But Jesus isn't named in Israel yet. Like they don't know that's going to be his name. The angel would come later and say, Mary, Joseph, his name is Yeshua. He is in the image of the military conquest man because he will give his people their abiding city. So Joshua squares off with Jesus. It's not that he knew fully what he was doing, but guys, anytime an angel receives worship, it's not an angel, okay? Only angels are terrified to receive worship. They saw Satan crave it and they went, no thanks, do not worship me. John tries to do it in Revelation. He falls down at an angel's feet and the angel goes, no, 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 get up, get up, do not do that. There is somebody who's worthy of that, and I'm not him. Jesus alone receives worship, and here he receives worship. This is what's called the pre-incarnate Christ. And listen to what he says. Are you for us or against us? And Jesus says, no. Not the right question. Just know, be encouraged. I'm here. You know what I take away from that? I take away that God loves the Palestinians and the Jews. He doesn't take sides in wars. He just says, Everything is all about me and my will. I'm just here to tell you, Joshua, that I'm doing something in Israel. I'm going to give you guys favor and give you this land because eventually I'm going to come into this land through this people to save all the nations. So this isn't so much about who I'm against and who I'm for. This is about me, my glory, my plan of salvation to rescue planet Earth. You understand? So, yes, Marvel movies. The creator of Marvel. I wish my dad kept his comic book collection. He had Spider-Man number one. And all these, like, Marvel movies, the, the creator, Stan Lee, makes a cameo. I just love right here in Joshua, Jesus makes a cameo. The author of the story enters the story and encourages Joshua to say, you have nothing to fear. Why? I'm here. The author of the story has come near to the camp of Israel. So Joshua met Joshua that day. Jesus met Jesus, the namesake, and obviously this happens. They march around the city seven times. Why do they have ram's horns? You know, because I'm covering so much ground, I'm not necessarily going to cite this to you, but seven times they march around the city on the seventh day. They've got the Ark of the Covenant, and then they start blowing ram's horns, and then the walls come tumbling down. See, I've delivered you, delivered Jericho into your hands, all the fighting men march around the city, do this for six days, have seven priests, God's number, carry the trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark, and on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. And when you hear the sound, a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Now, I showed you that a couple of weeks ago. We'll come back to it. All the sevens, the ark is right in the middle. Precise instructions, people in front of the ark, people behind. Basically all this symbolizes, if you put me in the center, you listen carefully to all my instructions. It couldn't have been 12 times, five times, no, seven times. You do this my way, all you're gonna need to do is blow the ram's horn and shout and the city's just gonna be yours. Did Joshua do anything? Any fighting? You see any bow and arrows being shot here? No, God just does it. The secret of his success was just following God and keeping God at the center of the camp. And that ram's horn, by the way, remember Abraham and Isaac? When he doesn't kill his son on the altar, on Mount Moriah, we talked about this a few weeks ago, a ram's head gets stuck in a bush. So forevermore after that, they would use these ram's horns to be reminded that God will one day provide the sacrifice. He provided the ram for, for Abraham to not sacrifice his own son, and we will remember that story forever by blowing these ram's horns. So all of that, the scarlet robe is symbolic, the blood, we're about to go to the communion table, only by the blood of the lamb, only that color could save Rahab. The Bible says without the shedding of, of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Rahab was doing exactly what God had instructed her to do. So a few applications, and then we're done. Consecrate yourselves. We've already talked about this, but I'm going to give you a, a demonstrated way that you can do this. Wonderful things may be in store in the Boulder Valley. 
I need your help. I don't want to be like General Patton as a pastor. I love him. I respect him. Don't hear me wrong. But I don't think I can lead this church by myself. I think the one thing I need more than anything else is the help of God himself. I don't want to be anything but a leader that points you to the help that God provides. We got some holes. I put a picture of that because all of Ryan's buddies and all the teenagers in Boulder matter a great deal to me. And we're short youth workers right now. We can hire them. We just got to find them. We're short a college ministry staffer right now. We're short some people on the children's ministry. Consecrate yourselves on Thursday if you're able. At noon, we're going to intercede for these positions. I don't know where to find them. I don't need to know. God knows. We need him to bring them to us so that we can reach the teenagers, the children, the college students that see you for Christ. So we're going to pray in the chapel noon this Thursday. If you're able to fast a meal, if you're able to fast all day, do it. Consecrate yourself. The Lord wants to do wonderful things. But we got to yield ourselves to him and say, God, we want, we want to do our part. Our part, we're going to consecrate ourselves. We're going to pray. You help us. We'll follow you as you lead us. So we'd love to invite you to that. Number two, if we want to win over Boulder, just know, I've already said this, but let me just drive this home. If we want to reach the people of this city, and many people here don't know Jesus, it's not going to be because we build bigger buildings. It's not going to be because your pastor gets better at preaching. It's not going to be a small group strategy. Those things are important, but the most important thing is the presence of God himself. Joshua won because God was there. With you, I will be, says God. With Grace Commons, God must be. When you pray for this church, that is the number one prayer. God, be with us. We want to be with you. Nobody but Jesus will do. We need your very presence here at this church at all times. I love that guy because I love Jewish people. When I think about the Holocaust, my head and my heart hurt. And I know Churchill played a role in freeing the Jews from that captivity. But you know what? I think there's a God the God of Israel had a hand in it too. And so God uses leaders. He does. I know many of you have anxiety about which one of these people is going to win. Let me just tell you something. Vote for whoever you want. As long as God is the God of Grace Commons, as long as in your life Jesus is on the throne, let whatever politician take the White House wants to take, let God be in charge of that. You pray for your church to have the anointing of God, for your country to have the anointing of God. Whatever leader you have, if they're without God, it doesn't do any good. So you pray for the anointing of God to be on your country, for the anointing of God to be on your church, for the presence of God to be in your home, and good things will happen. Put the anxiety to rest and put it all, put all your eggs in the basket of the near presence of God like Joshua did. Carefully following all of God's instructions is a huge part of this. Now remember, the guarantee of success is the word of God. I want to be a church with an open Bible. We don't get to make up our own rules. We don't, we don't need to. God's rules are perfect. Everything he says, I want to follow it. So follow me as I seek to tell God every day, only scripture for us. Whatever we do, we're just going to listen to your word and trust everything it says. Finally, make sure you've booked your reservation to the city that Joshua won. Book your reservation. I've Hilton for years, I've been thinking, Man, my kids may one day get to go stay in a hotel in outer space. Y'all heard about this? There are people that are smart that are trying to build hotel space. Disney has fake versions of that where you get to eat, you know, in Disney World up at the top and it looks like you're in outer space. And I, I think that would be cool. You know what the best thing ever though is? This story foreshadows the name of Jesus. This, every story whispers his name. Who is Jesus in light of the story of Joshua? He's the one that has given you the opportunity to book your reservation in the city that is abiding, not Jericho, not this little promised, you know, Middle Eastern place called Israel. That was the down payment on the abiding city we call heaven. Jesus, the reason he is named, in my opinion, Yeshua, in Joshua's honor, is because he would be the one that would come to give you a conquest into a greater city, but not by fighting, by laying down his life. This table represents the warrior of God, the son of God, the commander of the Lord's army that would say, I'm not going to go whip Rome. I'm going to let Rome whip me, all the flesh off my back. 
to atone for your sins so that you and I can book our reservation in the greatest city of all, the abiding city we call heaven. Now listen, I do want to close by making sure you understand there's something about Joshua that is about Jesus that we need to understand. Look, those trumpets also foreshadowed something. On the last day, when the culmination of world history happens and Jesus comes again, there's talk about a trumpet sounding, just like in Joshua's day. God's not finished with those trumpets. When Jesus comes again, there will be a trumpet sound, and the abiding city will be presented to you, not because you fight for it, because the battle's already been won. Say amen if you agree. Amen. Now listen, the next time he comes, I want you to know this. The next time he comes, they're not putting one of those on his head, friends. The next time he comes, he will be more in the issue of Joshua, in the image of Joshua. Nobody's going to spit on him. Nobody's slapping him. Nobody will mock him. Nobody will do anything but bow their knee, is what the Bible says. At earth's rightful king. That comes from England, the crown of jewels and all that. I love going there because I, my, my mind goes straight to Jesus. All the crowns of heaven are in his honor. So be encouraged, friends, that sometimes in the world it looks dark. Man, this world, where is it going? What's happening? Blah, blah, blah. Listen, that's where it's going. A king will take his rightful place and present you and I into the city. But how did he do it? Right here. The ushers will now come forward. Communion. Uh, ushers will come forward. The verse I want to read to you as we prepare ourselves for this. We're going to get a cracker here in just a moment. I haven't said this to you yet, but it needs to be the DNA of our communion experiences every time we approach this table. This is what the Apostle Paul says about communion. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Meaning, there's not one person in this room, no offense to you, I'm not trying to offend you, I'm just telling you the truth. Nobody earned what Jesus did. Nobody's worthy of it. John cries in Revelation when he sees that nobody can open these scrolls. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Nobody can go to heaven. And the angel says, don't cry. The Lamb of God has triumphed. You can come in not because of what you do, because of what he did. And so Paul says, that's not something that you're flipping about. No, you come examining your failures. Because they, not because they disqualify you. They don't keep you out of heaven. But part of honoring Jesus is coming to him saying, I'm going to examine myself. I know I don't deserve this. And I want to consecrate myself in a fresh way when I come to the communion table. And I want to turn away from some of that stuff that was the reason you had to come to the cross. So that's why Paul says, this isn't a party when you take communion. It's actually a pretty sobering experience to meditate on your sin so that when you come to this table, you know what you've been set free from and forgiven of. Does that make sense? So what you're supposed to do when these crackers come around is examine yourself. Is say, God, I'm so sorry. I'm thinking about my week, my day even. I don't want to be that anymore. I don't want to use those words anymore. I don't want to treat my spouse that way. I don't want to micromanage my children this way. I don't want to be this kind of employee. I want to be in, 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 in the image of Christ. So help me, forgive me. And friends, that's a huge part of this. Let's experience the Lord's Supper together, friends. Cracker, save it. We're going to eat it together. When it comes around, just hold it.
there's, there's two elements to communion for a reason. Because some of the great heresies in the history of the church are that Jesus didn't have a body. That's false. That's false. Something happened to a physical body. His body was physically tortured on our behalf. And so the bread represents the human body. He's fully God and fully human, right? So this bread represents what happened to the human body of Christ. Let's eat it together. But it couldn't just be his body. The Bible had said that scarlet piece of fabric that was in Rahab's window had to be this color, symbolic of the fact that God had said all throughout the Old Testament, blood atonement is the way that you'll be forgiven. And so Jesus said, take this cup, drink in remembrance of me. It represents the shedding of blood which is the forgiveness, the guarantee of your forgiveness of sin and mine. We're not going to take this together. You're free to take this at your own pace. After you've had a moment to reflect, let's drink in honor of what Jesus has done for us through his blood. Friends, let me invite us to stand. Would you pray with me as we enter into our last time of worship together? Lord, we thank you for the gift of this table. We thank you for being our king, and we pray that as you commanded us, Lord, that we would remember that whatever it is we are bringing in with us to this service, that you would turn our hearts, that you would refocus our minds and our souls on who you are. And because of who you are and what you laid down on the cross, who we can say that we are, that we are your people. May we know that reality, Lord, and may we consecrate ourselves that your kingdom would be known here in our community and in our town. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Sing this together, I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are. 
Hopefully now you're looking forward to your dinner in heaven. You know what to say to Joshua, right? A um, couple of things. One, our prayer partners are here. They always are. If you need to pray, fresh prayer for a consecration in a special way. For any reason, they're here for that or anything else you might want to pray for. It's right to take timeouts in life. To say, I've examined myself and God, I want to give you my life in a fresh way. But the song said it well. The communion table doesn't mean beat yourself up. It means examine yourself so that you can be reminded that God will never quit on you. That what Jesus has done for you sets you free. It means you're his child. But being his child doesn't mean continuing on in sin. It means leaving it behind and continually saying, I consecrate myself. So they're here to pray for you. If you need to pray about that or anything else, take advantage of that. We're going to pray at noon. So just be reminded you don't have to come. Some of you work. Some of you may be out of town. No worries, but those of you who can come, the chapel, noon, it's not going to be a long time, but we're going to seek God for the people that I know he wants to call here to, to labor with us. 
And finally, if you haven't been baptized, September 29th is coming fast. I'd love to meet with you. It's going to be a very special day. We're going to put people in the water to symbolize what Jesus has done. So if you'd like to be included in that, just simply send me a note, an email, email uh, Janet, and we'll, we'll get you lined out. Friends, let's leave this place celebrating what Jesus has done, resting in the confidence that we are God's children through Christ. Amen.